What's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. This is part two of my review of Icewind Dale Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. In part one, I covered the new spells. There are only three of them introduced in this new book. I will leave a link to it right up here. If you have not seen that video yet, go and watch it. This video is going to focus on the new magic items introduced in this book. So without further ado, let's just jump right into it. So these are the magic items. There are 10 in total. So let's just start right away at the top with the Abracadabras. It is a very rare item. The Abracadabras is an ornate gemstone studded wooden chest that weighs 25 pounds. Its interior compartment is a cube measuring one and a half feet on a, a side. The chest has 20 charges. A creature can use an action to touch the closed lid of the chest and expend one of the charges while naming one or more non-magical objects including raw materials, foodstuffs, and liquids worth a total of one gold or less. The named objects magically appear in the chest provided they can fit all inside and the chest does not contain anything else. For example, it can conjure a plate of strawberries, a bowl of hot soup, a flagon of water, a stuffed animal, or a bag of 20 caltrops. Food and drink conjured by the chest are delicious and they'd spoil if not consumed after 24 hours. Gems and precious metals created by the chest disappear after one minute. The chest regains 1d20 expended daily charges at dawn. If the item's last charge is expended, roll a d20 on a 1. The chest loses its magic, becoming an ordinary chest, and the gemstones turn to dust. So this is a box of seemingly infinite supplies. Very rare. That sounds about right for this. This is definitely could be used in a survival scenario, which this book seems to be going for that kind of narrative. So very nice item overall. Let's move on to the Cauldron of Plenty. It is a rare item. This cauldron is made of thick copper that has turned green with age. It is four feet wide and has a mouth three and a half feet in diameter, weighs 50 pounds, and can hold up to 30 gallons of liquid. Embossed on its bulging sides are images of satyrs and nymphs in repose holding ladles. The cauldron comes with a lid and has side handles. It sits on five little clawed feet that keep it from tipping. If water is poured into the cauldron and stirred for one minute, it transforms into a hearty hot stew, which can provide one nourishing meal for up to four people per gallon. The stew remains hot while in the cauldron, then cools naturally after it is removed. The cauldron can create stew three times and then ceases to function until the next dawn when it regains all uses. So you can use this cauldron to create your three square meals a day, seemingly ad infinitum, never having to scrounge for food. These are very nice items just for survivalists. Like... I I really like these. Next up, we have the Hook of Fisher's Delight, another rare item. This tiny silver fish hook has a gold little gold feather attached to it. For it to function, the feathered hook must be tied to the end of the fishing line and be immersed in enough water to fill at least a 10-foot cube. At the end of each uninterrupted hour of, immer of immersion, roll a d6. On a 6, a floppy 6-inch-long magical fish appears at the end of the hook. The hook and properties of the conjured fish are determined by rolling on the Hook of Fisher's, De Fisher's Delight table. Once the hook conjures a fish, it cannot do so again until the next dawn. So a guaranteed catch once per day of a fish. What do they do? 1 through 10 green with copper bands. The tasty fish provides a day's worth of nourishment to one creature that eats it. The fish loses its property and rots if it's not eaten in 24 hours. 11 through 14, yellow with black stripes. Once removed from the hook, this awful tasting fish can be thrown up to 120 feet, targeting a creature the thrower can see. The target must succeed on DC 15 strength save or be knocked prone. The fish then disappears. That is comically hilarious. 15 through 18, blue with white bands. When released from the hook, this fish squirms free, sprouts wings, follows you around, and sings a beautiful tune in Aquan. Disappears after 2d4 hours when reduced to zero hit points. The fish uses the Quipper stat block listed right here. You can see a little bit of it. Except it can breathe air and has a flying speed of 30 feet. 19 and 20, gold with silver stripes. The safety fish provides a day's worth of nourishment to one creature that eats it and gains 2d10 temporary hit points to that creature. The fish loses these properties if not eaten within 24 hours of being caught. So, pretty useful. I don't really see you going out of your way to do this every hour or once per or an hour once per day, but sure. Lantern of Tracking, a common item. This hooded lantern burns for six hours on one pint of oil, shedding bright light in a 30-foot radius and a dim light for an additional 30 feet. Each Lantern of Tracking is designed to track down a certain type of creature, which is determined by rolling on the Lantern of Tracking table. Once determined, it cannot be changed. When the Lantern is within 30 feet of the creature of that type, its flame turns bright green. The Lantern does not pinpoint the exact location of the creature. So you get 1 through 10, roll d10, Aberrations, Celestials, Constructs, Dragons, Elementals, Fae, Fiends, Giants, Monstrosities, or Undead. Next up, we have Professor Orb, a, a rare item. Professor Orb is a smooth five-pound sphere of smoky gray quartz about the size of a grapefruit. 
Close examination reveals two or more pinpricks of silver light coming from deep inside the sphere. This, this orb is sentient and has the personality of a scholar. Its alignment is determined by rolling on the alignment table in the sentient magic item section of the DMG. Regardless of its alignment, the orb has an intelligence of 18 and a wisdom of charisma determined by rolling 3d6 for each ability. So you're rolling for stats for this one. The orb speaks, reads, and understands four languages and can see and hear normally out to a range of 60 feet. Unlike most other sentient items, the orb has no known, no goals of its own and can't initiate a conflict with the creature in possession of it. The orb has extensive knowledge of four narrow academic subjects. When making an intelligence check to recall lore from any of its areas of expertise, the orb has a plus nine bonus to its role, including its intelligence modifier. In addition to the knowledge it possesses, the orb can cast Mage Hand at will. It uses the spell to only transport itself. The spellcasting ability is intelligence. Very specific, very niche. Not really sure how useful this is. I guess it's, it has more context in the actual adventure module itself, so I wouldn't really see a purpose in running this outside of that, as it does have its very own unique person involved. Professor Scant, Professor Orb owned by v Velen Harpel and stolen by Nas Latimer, calls itself Professor Scant. It is lawful good and has a wisdom of 11 and a charisma of 9. It speaks and reads common draconic Elvish and Loros, the dead language of the Empire of Nether Netheril. Professor Scant is a chatterbox and assumes all humanoids are dunderheads. When elaborating on its areas of expertise, it adopts an unintentionally patronizing tone as, in, as the following or, four areas of expertise. History of Netheril, see the fate of Netheril, part of the adventure. Vampirism and the traits of vampires. Rituals surrounding the making, bottling, and drinking of Elverquist, a rare ruby-colored elven liquor distilled from sunshine and rare summer fruits. And the Tarasque. So, very niche, meant for this adventure only. Don't run this outside of this. This is pretty interesting, though. Next up, we have Psy Crystal, an uncommon item that requires attunement by a creature of intelligence score of three or higher. Each crystal grants you telepathy for as long as you remain attuned to it. See the introduction of the monster manual and see how telepathy works. The crystal also glows with the purplish inner light while you are attuned to it. The higher your intelligence, the greater the light's intensity and the greater the range of the telepathy. See the Psy Crystal's properties table right here. The higher your intelligence, the higher your range of telepathy, the higher the light intensity of the crystal itself, up to a range of 120 feet if your int is 16 or higher. Next up, the man, the meme itself, the scroll of Tarask summoning. A legendary scroll using an action to read this scroll causes the Tarask right here. See this creature entering the monster manual to appear in an unoccupied space you can see within one mile of you. Tarask disappears and drops to zero hit points and is hostile to all creatures towards itself. Does not disappear any time before you kill it or it kills you. Or it is kills all of your enemies should you summon it on top of their land. Well, I don't see any good use of ever using this item unless you want to completely derail your campaign. But there it is. It is now 5th edition canon. Go ahead. Go crazy. Next up, we have Scroll of the Comet, a letter of the legendary scroll. By using an action to read the scroll, you cause a comet to fall from the sky and crash to the ground at a point you can see up to one mile away. You must be outdoors when you use the scroll or nothing happens and the scroll is wasted. The comet creates a 50 foot deep, 500 foot radius crater on impact. Any creature that is in that race can take a DC 20 dex save or take 30 D10 force damage on a failed save or half on a successful one. All structures are immediately destroyed and all non-magical objects that aren't being worn are held as well. So you used your scroll of Tarask by accident, or the BBEG uses the scroll of a Tarask. You use your scroll of a, com of a comet. Knock it out. There you go. It solves itself. Next up, we have the thermal cube, a common item. This three inch cube of solid brimstone generates enough dry heat to keep the temperature within 15 degrees of it at 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So a heat shield around the item. Pretty easy to just put in a campfire. And there you go. You don't have to actually light a campfire. Pretty simple item. I like it. Next up, we have Yithrin Mithalar. It's a phrase and a half. A legendary item that requires attunement by a spellcaster. The Mithalar looks like an enormous crystal ball held in an ornate cradle. The globe sheds bright light in a 300 foot cube and dim light an additional 300 feet. The globe draws magic from the weave that can be harnessed for various purposes. For example, Netherese mages use Mithalars to keep their cities aloft and empower their magic items. The bigger the Mithalar, the more magic it can hold. The largest Mithalars are 150 feet in diameter. The Yithrin Mithalar is a relatively small device, a mere 50 feet in diameter. To attune to this Mithalar, a creature must finish a short rest within 30 feet of it. Meditating on the Mithalar, 
Up to eight creatures can be attuned to it at one time. Otherwise, the Yithrin Mythalar allows all of the attunement rules in the DMG. If a ninth creature tries to attune to it, nothing happens. All creatures attuned to it can sense when the device is being used. A creature attuned to the device can use any of its properties, but only if all other creatures attuned to the device agree to it. The Yithrin Mythalar's properties are as follows. While you are in the same plane of existence as the Mythalar, you can use an action to cause it to fly in any direction you choose at a speed of 30 feet. All matter within 500 feet of the device moves with it, including creatures. The Yithrin Mythalar and all structures held aloft by it, by it hover in place when not in motion. So, Floating City, the magic item. As an action, you can cause one magic item you are holding within 30 feet of the Yithrin Mythalar to immediately regain all of its expended charges or uses. A magic item recharged in this manner cannot be recharged by the Mythalar again until after the item regains expended charges or uses it on its own. You can use the Mythalar to cast Control Weather spell without requiring any components and without the need for you to be outdoors. Like this casting of the, of the spell has a 50 mile radius. For the duration of the spell's casting time, you must be within 30 feet of the Mythalar or the spell fails. And this is what it looks like. This is some really nice art you got right here. Touching the Mythalar. Any creature that touches the globe of the Mythalar must make a DC 22 con save or take 180 or 20 D10 plus 70 radiant damage on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. Undead have disadvantage on the saving throw and any object that touches the globe other than an artifact or the Mythalar's cradle is disintegrated instantly. No save. So this item is... It's campaign based. This item would not be used under any normal circumstances other than to drive an entire city that you would be used in a campaign. This is not just something you pick up and play with at random. This isn't really something you give to your players. This is, yeah, this is an adventure based item. So pretty cool either way. Again, if you want to derail your campaign, give this to your party. Clearly a tomb trap, a tomb tapper defends the Yithrin Mythalar from a group of treasure hunters. So that is it for the magic items. We're just going to quickly go over the two books that you also get with this adventure that we talked about in the last video cover the new spells these books have the new spells in them two books are described in the ascension they can find the codicil of white in chapter five if you run this adventure by the book codicil of white is a tall thin volume of white ermine fur over seasonal boards of white pine and sealed in a clasp and locked of tarnished silver nestled among these descriptions is a spell that wizards can learn frost fingers can be found in this book so this is where you would learn that spell and for the other two spells, the incantations of Ariolarthos. Yep. The incantations of Ariolarthos is a weighty spell book that has all of these spells. I will let you read over all of these to see if you like this. But this is what you get. The two note ones that you get in here are the Create Majin, which we talked about last time, creating a half simulacrum of yourself that you can choose between three different ones with different abilities at the cost of your maximum HP or Blade of Disaster, your massive spiritual weapon plus spell right here. You'd get those both in this book. So that is it for the books, and that is going to do it for the magic items introduced in Icewind Dale, Rime of the Frostmaid, and there were 10 or 12 if you count the books total. A lot of these were really interesting. We're very, very specific to this module. Obviously, as this is an adventure module, these aren't really meant to go any further than this book. But you could take these, use them in your game, go ahead, derail your campaign with your Scroll of Tarask Summoning, and then fix it with the Scroll of the Comet. But these were really nice items overall. I'm excited to throw these into my own homebrew campaigns. But if you guys enjoyed this review, be sure to leave it a like and subscribe if you haven't. If there's any other pertinent information in Icewind Dale, Rime of the Frostmaiden that I should definitely review, that you guys think I should review, leave it in the comments down below. I don't really see anything else in this book too important. It is an adventure book, but if there's some burning questions you guys have, leave them in the comments. I'll be sure to answer them in the next video. So until next time, guys, have fun, stay safe, and as always, happy gaming.